Welcome back. I'm Frey Jones, reporting live from France, where the Paris Peace Conference has just signed the Treaty of Savra. Today, August 10th, 1920, will surely be a day that goes down in history. So what's so special about this treaty? Well, it was made to put an end to the Armenian, Assyrian, and Christian Greek genocides that have been occurring in the Ottoman Empire since 1914. The idea is that this will lead to the partitioning of the Ottoman Empire so that no such atrocities can occur in the future. That's right, and while the murder and exile of about 1.5 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and surrounding areas has been in the news thus most often lately, it's also important for us to also realize that the Assyrians and Christian Greeks have also suffered greatly. Yes, and while the Assyrian and Christian Greek massacres are not technically classified as genocides by the Turkish government, it is undeniable that a great wrong has been done to these groups of people. In addition to the Treaty of Savra, the organizers and leaders of these massacres are currently going through a series of trials called the 1919-1920 Court Martials, and if convicted, this could lead to them being sentenced to death for these crimes against humanity. Hopefully these people will be able to recover after years of suffering and terror. Well, we do have an author here today named Anatole France. Here's a quote from him written in 1960. Armenia is dying, but it will survive. The little blood that is left is precious blood that will give birth to a heroic generation. If a nation does not want to die, it will not die. Thank you, Mr. France. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. I'm Freya Jones, signing off. Welcome back. I'm Lori Messenger reporting on the Fatty Arbuckle murder scandal. We have some breaking news just released. Roscoe Arbuckle, often referred to as Fatty Arbuckle, has been acquitted by the jury at his third trial. Freya, would you like to tell us a little bit more about this case? Absolutely. So, Arbuckle was a slapstick comedy star of the 1910s. However, one night at an apartment party on September 5th, 1921, when struggling actress Virginia Rath was found screaming on a bed. Arbuckle was accused of rape and murder. We do know that that night they were in the same room together. However, their stories of what happened are very different. Arbuckle claimed he found Rappe passed out on the bathroom floor, so he carried her into a bedroom where the, she then fell off the bed and injured herself. Rappe, however, claims that Arbuckle assaulted her, telling her friend, he did this to me, as they left the apartment party. She was brought to the emergency room three days later, where she died of peritonitis, an infection caused by a ruptured bladder. We do know that she was already suffering from a bladder condition called cystic cystitis before the incident. Upon inspection, there were no signs of sexual assault. While the public was widely convinced of Arbuckle's guilt, there were holes in the case. Rappi's friend and Arbuckle's chief accuser, Bambina Delma, was a convicted felon herself, who admitted she was planning to extort money from the slapstick star. There was also evidence from several witnesses that they had been, plan they had been persuaded to testify by means of an intimidation and force. Though Arbuckle has been acquitted of his crimes, he is still blacklisted by the film industry. At the end of his third trial, the jury went so far as to write Arbuckle a letter of apology saying, and I quote, Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. A grave injustice has been done. This is Lori Messenger. Tune in next time to learn about the scandals of Warren Harding. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Scott Jones, and today we're going to be discussing the affairs of Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding was elected as the 29th President of the United States of America in 1921. He married Florence Mabel Harding in 1891 when he was 26 years old and she was 31. 
In recent news, Harding died on August 2nd, 1923, at the age of 57 of a stroke. However, after his death, a series of scandals have been brought to light, one of which was his affair with Secretary Nan Britton. It lasted nearly 15 years, particularly spanning the last years of his life while he held office and going until his death. While this was not his first affair, it has been the most publicized because in 1919, Nan Britton became pregnant with Harding's child. The young woman was allegedly infatuated with Harding from a young age, going so far as to plaster her room with his campaign poster. After his death, she said of the affair, The fact that I was so ignorant seemed to add to his cherishment of me for some reason. Have there been any repercussions? When Nan Britton's daughter Elizabeth was born on October 22, 1919, Harding immediately began paying them generous child support payments. However, he never spent much time with the girl, even though Nan Britton and him continued to meet, writing each other's letters, and even seeing each other at the White House. After Harding's death, Nan Britton sued his estate to get a trust fund for her daughter. However, when she didn't get the money, she went on to write the best-selling book called The President's Daughter about her affair with Harding. You've been listening to Scott Jones on the news. Please tune in tomorrow for our next segment, a continuation of Harding's scandals. Welcome back. I'm Freya Jones, and today we'll be continuing our discussion of Warren G. Harding. Since Harding's death, a series of scandals have arisen, one of those being the Teapot Dome scandal. The Teapot Dome is an oil reserve in Wyoming. which, along with two in California, have long been reserved for emergency Navy use only. However, once Harding took office, he immediately appointed New Mexico Senator Albert Hall as Secretary of the Interior. And Fall then convinced Harding to transfer the oil reserves to his department. Fall then proceeded to lease the Teapot Dome oil reserves to a longtime friend, Harry Sinclair. who owned the Mammoth Oil Company. He also leased the California Reserves to another friend, Edward Donaghy, who owns the Pan American Petroleum Company. Mm -hmm. All three oil rigs combined were estimated to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and all the companies had to do in exchange was build an oil storage facility and an oil pipeline for the government. By April of 20, 1922, rumors were spreading and the Senate opened an investigation. Then, a man named Colonel James Darden claimed he had first right to Teapot Dome, so he brought in equipment to start drilling. Fall then convinced Harding to dispatch Marines to stop Darden from taking the oil. However, the Denver Post found out about the incident and blackmailed Sinclair into paying them one million dollars to stop posting incriminating articles. Harding, feeling the stress and pressure from all the corruption in his system, famously said, I have no trouble with my enemies. I can take care of my enemies, all right, but my damn friends, my goddamned friends, white, they're the ones who keep me walking the floor nights. While Harding was less directly involved than Fall was, it was rumored that Sinclair did offer to buy Harding's newspaper, The Marion Star, for an outrageously high amount of money and that after his term in office, Harding was planning on taking a year-long cruise with 50 friends on a yacht owned by Sinclair. However, Harding died before any further investigation could be done into his part in these shady dealings. This has been Freya, Laurie, Scott, and Virgil. Thank you and good night!